Hello, everyone. Welcome to Watts 2021, and thank you for joining us for today's fall feature. Today's guests are Catherine Bush and Kinesia Lubrin from the University of Guelph's Creative Writing MFA. We'll be discussing the benefits of studying creative writing, the ways art can help artists engage in the issues of our time, and what makes Guelph's literary community unique. I'm Sienna, and I'll be your host. Watts Toronto operates on land that is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Paytoon First Nations, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. This territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Anishinaabeg and Allied Nations to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land that you occupy, wherever it is that you're tuning in from. So our first guest today is Catherine Bush, who is the author of five novels, including Blaze Island from 2020, A Globe and Mail Best Book, and The Rules of Engagement, a national bestseller and New York Times notable book. Her books have been shortlisted for the Trillium and City of Toronto Book Awards. Her nonfiction has been published in the New York Times, Brick, Emergence, and Best Canadian Essays. She has been the coordinator of the Guelph Creative Writing MFA since 2008. Welcome, Catherine. Thanks so much, Sienna. <laughs> and our second guest today is Kinesia Lubrin. Kinesia is the author of three books, including Code Noir and The Disgraphist, winner of, among others, the Griffin Prize and the OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Literature. Awarded a 2021 Wyndham Campbell Poetry Prize, Lubrin is a creative writing professor at the University of Guelph. Welcome. Thank you so much. Lovely to be here. It's a pleasure to have you both to sit down and talk a little bit about the creative writing programs at Guelph, the MFA, and some other exciting things coming up. First, I would love for you to introduce yourselves in the context of this program. So perhaps I'll start with Catherine as, as someone who's been around the block and seen the, this program in and out for over a decade. Um, what is one fond memory that you have of teaching or coordinating the creative writing MFA at Guelph? <laughs> Yeah, well, I will just say I've been with this program since the beginning. I taught the very first work fiction workshop in 2006, and this is our 15th year, so that feels memorable. And we'll be celebrating it um, with the with the Toronto International Festival of Authors. So you know, keep an eye out for that. Fond memories. Oh my goodness, there's so many. But I will. I think what I'll do is just describe briefly what my yesterday looked like. I I teach the course that brings all the MFA students together, the plenary course, and this year it's called Writers in the World. And so we were all in person, you know, for the second time post pandemic. And we were discussing land based writing as a necessary decolonial project. And we were reading um, works by the Okanagan writer, um, Jeanette Armstrong, talking about indigenous land languages as being rooted um, and generated by the land, um, work by the Metis writer, Warren Carew, talking about our. Um, loss of, of sensory relationship to the land. Um, Robert McFarlane talking about lost English, particular language rooted in the land and neurodivergent voices and their different ways of, of responding to the, the landscape. So we did all that, um, spoke about our own land-based language and words that were powerful to us. Then at lunchtime, some of the students went on a tour of Rexdale, which is where we're located, led by one of the students who lives in that neighborhood. Uh -huh. and ending with um, lunch at a, a restaurant that makes Trinidadian doubles. And then we all, um, well, half of us actually gathered in Hyde Park for a movement workshop with trees in the afternoon, um, a way of, because writing is an embodied art and we yes. need to get out in the world and, yes. um, and explore our own landscapes. And you can't really touch each other, you know, during a pandemic, but you can touch trees. So we did that. And then some of us ended the evening going to the Dream in Hyde Park, um, is your microphone on which is a climate based work with um, youth actors and the moon was shining overhead and the oak trees the black oak trees in the park were lit so that's just a glimpse of one day in the life of um, you know the MFA program I will just give a shout out to some of our amazing MFA grads including Kinesia who will be um, coordinating this program um, starting next year Ayelet Sabari um, the wonderful nonfiction fiction writer Jail Rich Richardson, um, author of Gutter Child, who's done so much to change the literary landscape, you know, here um, and across the country. So, yeah, over to you, Kinesia. 
We particularly love JL as a fellow festival organizer with the Festival of Literary Diversity or the Fold. Um, they yes. do incredible work over there and we're always very happy to see what they what they make. And at the time of this recording, I'm pretty sure Fold Kids is coming up in, in, in November. Um, so keep an eye out for their schedule because I'm sure it's going to be super cool. So yeah, Kinesia, as an incoming prof, as, as someone who's just about to kind of jump into this world, and also as an alumna, um, what's one memorable moment that stuck with you from your time pursuing your degree? Well, you know, Catherine has done, you know, such an amazing job giving you a bird's eye view of a single day in the MFA. Um, and, you know, that speaks to the sort of uh, the, the broader, um, you know, substantive work of imagining a writer's life, you know, and, and that is, that's so wonderful. I didn't have that particular day um, <laughs> in the MFA <laughs> and I'm very jealous about the doubles right now, but. <laughs> <laughs> they were amazing, I have to say. <laughs> oh, Don't I'm tempt us. That, you know. <laughs> Keeping the drooling under control is hard. Um, but you know, here is a small moment for you, right? So. I was in the 2012 cohort. Um, and there's a lot that's memorable, including the peers you meet and keep. You know, you're still friends with these people um, so many years into your future. And that helps to sustain your writing life as well. Mm. But asking for a single moment is like asking a parent to choose among their children, choose a favorite, or, you know, asking an author to choose a favorite book that they've <laughs> written. You're asking for <laughs> trouble. Uh, but I will tell you that in Dion Brand's poetry workshop, she asked me a question that completely reoriented my sense of what I thought language was and why I was doing the work that I was doing in it. Um, and so to really think about writing and its broader implications. So I'm telling you about a moment that has so much gravity that it, it still functions in that way for me to this day. You know, And so uh, I think the books that I've written would have been very, very different books had it not been for that very small moment, that single question lasting about two seconds, that intervention, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so you have those big, amazing things, but you also have the micro, you know, the small moments that can really do big things for you. So fabulous. The, the weight of them, like the density of those moments is, is just incomparable sometimes. Yeah. You know, and I'm sure many students have these sorts of small moments in, in many of their classes, so. Yeah, and that's something that I'd really like to dig into a little bit is the the collection of those small moments in something like an MFA or a degree program because creative writing we know unlike you know trades like plumbing or surgery um, this is something that artists can self teach and they can in fact master without any formal training you know lots of reading lots of intentional exercises community grassroots stuff that's it's possible to do so I would love to hear a little bit about the benefits of studying creative writing in a structured setting like an MFA or a degree program. Program. You know, how can this uh, intentional environment uh, really enrich and evolve a writer's relationship to their craft, to their writing practice? And perhaps we can bounce back to Kinesia to start. Yeah. Yeah, I, absolutely. Um, you know, it's it's really interesting what how you formulate something called formal training. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think that anyone masters anything without training. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the idea that literature is just something you wake up one day, one Saturday in your life and do it well is a kind of fallacy. <laughs> no, it truly is, right? Even though I understand the impulse, you know, to land in that simplistic place. It's, you know, as Toni Morrison says in her noble lecture, we die. That may be the meaning of our lives, but we do language. And that may be the measure of our lives. Brilliant, yes. But, you know, I think as a languaged species, we tend to think we're always already masters of right, of language itself. So, <laughs> uh, but you know, I think the thing about writing that is literature itself, uh, which is to say writing that is art, isn't the thing we're born knowing how to do. Uh, mm -hmm. and so we spend our whole lives actually, in effect, trying to master it, whether through an institutional route like an MFA or in another way. And, and believe it or not, uh, the thing we call formal training is is often the better route for a lot of people whose lives don't allow for, uh, you know, another informal way to really spend sustained time um, learning and trying and failing and and coming back in in a in a short space of time to the the training and learning and practice of writing. I've often talked about things I learned from my grandmother, mm -hmm. but I also have an MFA, you know, 
And so both things sort of enrich each other in a sense. So to, to cut this little mini lecture short. <laughs> I'm loving it. <laughs> I think in a program like an MFA, even with all the, you know, reasonable and understandable and well-worn limitations of institutionalization, the writing life in its broad sense is what we apprentice, you know, through the kind of rigor of reading, writing, learning practice, alongside others uh, who are also deeply invested in the work of literature. You know, much like you've heard Catherine give you a sense of, of a day like that. I mean, where else does that happen in that, you know, in a sort of really concentrated manner, you know? Um, and so that's, I think, the, the main um, value and texture of that kind of learning um, for me certainly was, was invaluable, so. Mm -hmm. I really resonate with the idea of a container for these activities and for that sustained practicing, as you were saying, that sustained time to, to try and iterate and, and fail at things and, and learn from the failure. Yeah. Catherine, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I want to, um, you know, first of all, in, in Kinesi's opening comments, she talked about how the, you know, her experience in the MFA gave her a community of, of writers. And I think that's so important. And it's, I mean, it's so generous for me as the coordinator to kind of watch these communities form and last, you know, for, for years, these ongoing friendships. And, you know, writing is a solitary art and we all have to find, you know, the, the time to, to do it and give it its intensity of concentration. But, and I know that, you know, many people come to a writing program wanting access to connections and, and markets, but, but I also think it's a place to think deeply about what a writing life means and, and how writing can be a way of being in, in the world. Um, it's an epistemology, ultimately. You know, we're language making, story making creatures. So how do we learn, learn to do that with more depth that will allow us to engage with the world with more depth and, and complexity? And I think too of writing as a, as a gift making art. And, you know, we may go on to market, but we also want readers, an audience, another to receive the work. And the creative writing community can can provide that, um, you know, provide feedback, but also give you a chance to really think more deeply and generatively about, you know, your intentions in, in your in your writing and, and how and how they're received and how you might realize them more more fully. So I did I mean I just would echo Kinesia's emphasis of the the fullness of the writing life. Um, and being exposed to it in its complexity. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what I would add. That sense of community is often so difficult to find actually outside of um, say intentional communities like this, right? Especially say with, with writing as a, as a largely solitary thing, eventually you do have to just sit down at the desk and, and do it. Um, but it is, it sounds really uh, attractive to have a group of like-minded folks who are all learning together, have that mastermind going on. And also differently minded folks, I, I would add. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the important things about a creative writing community is it brings together such a, or can bring together such a diversity of imaginaries. And that's certainly something we look for in the Guelph Creative Writing MFA to create a truly diverse community. And so people are speaking from their very different places and, and to engage with that complexity, I think is necessary as as being a writer of, of depth and meaning in, in the world. Definitely. So to speak of depth and meaning in the world, and also, like you said, Catherine, of writing as a, a way of engaging in life, I hear there's a new undergraduate program in creative writing that is coming very soon to Guelph, uh, which is very exciting. Um, the word on the street is that this program is going to focus <laughs> specifically. <laughs> I had to. I had to. Um, this program is going to focus kind of specifically on writing that it revolves around environmental justice and social activism. Um, so tell me a little bit about the decision to to put this program in, in orbit around those those issues and those areas of our lives. Perhaps I can speak to that because I, yeah. you know, I have been involved in the, the creation of this of this program, and um, we'll both be teaching in it. But I'll be teaching in it starting starting next year. And you know, there are a number of undergraduate creative writing um, programs in the Greater Toronto Southern Ontario area. So we were really looking for a way to make a, a program that was unique in its focus and and timely and and had an an urgency um, in its approach to the kind of imaginaries that we you know need to be focusing on on now and and Guelph itself as a university has a strong environmental focus and we certainly want to strengthen um, our environmental humanities focus. 
Um, but it's, you know, it seems to me that, again, you know, writing is a way of engaging with the world we live in and the futures that we might want to imagine. And so um, to bring this focus on, on social, social justice and environmental awareness and, you know, which dovetail into issues of, of climate justice, too. I mean, the turbulences of the, the last years, which are ongoing, um, bring together all these issues in our in our lives. And I and I think it's a it's a way for students to give students an opportunity to grapple with them while learning about form. And they can, you know, they can take these, their language abilities and their story making abilities out into the world with them. So there'll be courses that are focused on, on things like writing nature or speculative fiction or eco poetry and ones that are, are focused just on specifically on genre. But I think it's a really exciting development. And they all sound so yeah. cool. Like I want to go now. <laughs> Can you see, I don't, would you like to add anything about it? No, I mean, that sounds quite comprehensive. I'm still getting to know the major, um, still becoming more and more intimately uh, um, accustomed to to the plan. Um, but from what I've seen so far, um, you know, there's, there's certainly the unique configuration of a program that will stress from the outset um, the importance of uh, environmental and social justice um, awareness. But, you know, the, the, one of the foundational things about literature is, in fact, how it allows us manageable ways to look at the forces that animate the world we live in. Mm. So while we may not be able to come into the urgency of the moment, which certainly is about climate catastrophe, and all of the mounting social catastrophes out there, um, it's not just out there. We are, in, in a sense, always at an intersection in our own private individual lives. Uh, and so to have uh, students in, in, in a particular context, in a, in a context like this, work through what it means to be alive in our time, you know, which is what literature is. Shakespeare wrote about his time. You know, George Eliot, about George Eliot's time, uh, et cetera. Toni Morrison wrote about 19th century America. You know, and so in, in, in a sense, what we're doing here um, is not necessarily um, new, but it certainly is a sort, it, it is a kind of radical uh, awareness, a kind of training our attention in a radical way to look at the world boldly and honestly uh, and learn all of the craft things. Uh, that will allow us to do the things we need to do in our writing. Um, and so I think it's just, there's another layer of, of learning that's happening on top of what we normally do. And that can only be enriching, you know. Uh, I would just add that, I mean, after Kinesi's beautiful words, um, that we have amazing faculty, you know, who already are doing this kind of kind of work. Um, Dion Brand, you know, whom Kinesi has mentioned, Judith Thompson, the amazing playwright, Lawrence Hill, um, you know, Kinesia. Um, my last work was was Climate, Blaze Island is a climate focused novel. Um, we have the Guelph Institute of Environmental Research. I know that I'm leaving people people out, but I just wanted to, you know, give a it's sense a of the amazing, yeah. Yeah, the amazing faculty, um, you know, who are already in, engaged in, in this way and, and will be teaching in the program. Yeah, yeah also like, like well, yeah. the university has uh, all of these multiple uh, lenses through which that work can happen, all of the collab exciting collaborations that could happen, you know, with the Institute for Environmental um, Science and um, with theater, with digital humanities and, and all of that. So it's a really, really rich and exciting moment for the program. And uh, I will be going back to it four years into the future, five years into the future, um, but already very excited for what the work is. It sounds, I know I can list off at least six people at this point who'd be like, sign me up, let's go. <laughs> so I'd love to to talk a little bit about both of you personally and, and your um, your adventures in, in these areas and in using your writing to grapple with these things. Because in addition to being fantastic mentors and speakers, lecturers, you are both very seasoned writers. Uh, so I'd like to hear how your own creative writing practices intersect with your climate justice or your social justice practices. Like what, how do these things interplay with each other in your own personal experience? And perhaps we can start with, uh, with Catherine. 
Thanks, Sienna. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, um, my most recent novel, Blaze Island, is, is definitely climate themed um, and, and grappling, you know, with intergenerational responses to the climate crisis and, and how we, um, yeah, like confront, um, internalize climate emotion. It's, but I, you know, the, there's a long-term eco-focus in my work from my first novel, which, you know, features animal rights activists alongside a mother astronaut. Um, and a lot of my nonfiction work at the moment is also quite ecologically focused. I'm thinking a lot about our relationship as, as invasives on this land to invasive species on, on this land. Um, and my next novel will have a similar land-based focus. So I'm thinking a lot about how we can, you know, decenter the human and and respond to a living biosphere as as fiction writers, as storytellers. And you know, I, I do welcome the opportunity to bring these urgencies to the classroom. Yeah. You know, in line with just a larger interest in how we pay attention. You know, Kinesia mentioned that word, and it's such an important word to me. You know, as a writer and and as a as an educator, like that is the central urgency for me. How do we pay attention to the world, the world and the page? How do we bring that attention to the page um, through story, through language? Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, Catherine already. You know that that was quite an encompassing response. I think the only thing I would add, you know, because I think, you know, my, I have, people are tired of hearing my voice, I think. I just, you know, <laughs> I, I would not say so. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> About, you know, just the, you looking at how the world, uh, the world's horizontal relationships rather than the hierarchical relationships mm -hmm. um, that are centered in this in this sense of the world as uh, a kind of infinite space for human domination. Um, my work looks at the history of black diaspora, which is basically, you know, um, the colonial West, the history of the colonial West. Um, and in, in, in all of my work, there's a sense of the ecosphere. There's a sense of how the, the embodiment of human experience uh, is tied to what is beyond the human as a genre of, of being, of person. Mm -hmm. um, and so whether it's in my last book, The Dysgraphist, in which I look at the self, you know, what the self is uh, within a particular context, um, you know, meaning the categories that assert humanness mm -hmm. and how that leads to sort of destructive ideas about individualism. Um, when truly what we do is we, 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 we are alive in interconnectedness all the time, whether we disavow that or not. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting then for me to say that I'm not an activist, you know, an activist is a very, very particular, that, you know, you come to that space, it's a very special mode with its own histories and its own practices. Um, and, but what I do on the page uh, is in fact to offer a kind of imagination that appreciates activism, you know, and, and the work that that does to enliven us toward a fuller sense of what the world is. And hopefully, um, you know, to, to think through the ways that imagination actually has a function in that crucial work, you know, and so uh, being alongside in that way, you know, especially, um, you know, with, with, with uh, the kind of space that not, you know, the singular writer uh, teacher in a classroom is one thing, but to be alongside other writer teachers like Catherine and Dion and others, uh, and what kinds of imaginaries come out of that rich collaborative space as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's the bearing for me that I keep tinkering with. Yeah, I'm so glad you made that distinction between the work of imagination and activism, which can certainly coexist. But, you know, the work, uh, our work as writers seems to me to ask questions and explore complexities and doubts even and, um, and put the questions on the page and animate them um, and give life to embodied experience somehow, you know, how, how are we living and responding in these moments. Definitely. Also, I just got to say, like, a genre of being, it sounds like a book title. So, like, hold on to that one, because that's, I'd read that. Oh, yeah, that's good. I'll write that down. <laughs> yeah, it's your words. 
Oh, so talk to speak of doubts, Catherine, I, I wanted to know if both of you happen to have any advice for, for writers who are like maybe considering, like they're thinking about taking the plunge and, and applying for a program like this, but they're just not really certain or they don't know whether they're ready for it. What would your what would your advice be for helping people to orient themselves and, and decide if this is the right choice for them? Yeah, I mean, as you said in the beginning, I don't think, you know, every writer has to have an MFA to succeed. It's 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 one possible route. And as we've spoken about, I mean, it can provide an intensity of experience, a time span, a container, a community. Um, and if students or, or, or applicants, potential applicants are, are thinking about applying, um, I think, you know, you need to have the time in your life to commit to it, you know, really commit to it. And, you know, it's ideal if you come with a kind of project you'd like to work on, even if it's not fully formed. Um, also that you're committed to reading as well as writing. I think yeah. it's so important, um, you know, to the the, the project of a, of a writing life, the being of a writing life. And and our program, you know, make, puts a strong emphasis on reading. So, you know, writers need to be prepared to engage with that. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Can you see you've actually applied to the program in some way? Really. And, and here's the thing. The first time I applied to the MFA, I didn't get in. Okay. Uh, I got in the second time. Right. And so just to, to say bon courage, you know, hold on, you know, do if there is a desire for MFA and creative writing study in you, you do the thing necessary that will lead you to that. And, and Guelph's is a very special program. Um, in that it, it has removed some formal barriers. So I, we're going back to your phrase, uh, Sienna. <laughs> formal education. <laughs> in that you don't need a, an undergraduate degree, right, Catherine? Um, yeah. To get in, so that that that's very special. I think that's kind mm -hmm. of a thing to begin with. So there is uh, already an admission that one comes to this work by multiple routes, yeah. you know? Uh, and so the thing is, to, I would say to focus on the quality of the writing, you know, if you know if, if that is a thing that you're committed to, uh, and you 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 pour yourself into it, um, the the writing will actually in fact speak for itself. And there are very many factors that might go into whether or not you get accepted. Uh, but when I was you know accepted into the program, um, what what clicked for me was you know the question uh, the important question is what kind of writer do I want to be what kind of writer I am um, and how then is that work now continuous because really what it did was it lengthened my vision mm. yeah much farther into the future so um, to think in those terms um, of what that sort of time commitment for two years where you get time to study and write and read amongst your peers um, with one another and work on a project uh, that you have skewing uh, that might mean that might mean something uh, uh, great to you and, and and to others eventually. So uh, mm -hmm. the quality of the writing and bon courage. You know, if you don't get in, try again. Yeah, I would just add, you know, we're a small program, so we only accept, you know, a baker's dozen of students a, a year. Um, so, you know, there's like 26, uh, you know, sometimes the numbers fluctuate a bit, students in the program at one time. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, we have a large applicant pool, but we do, you know, Kinesia's story is so, so telling that, you know, one day or maybe not, and you'd just be those who, you know, a certain group of people have applied and that's the way it falls. And the next year, something totally different can happen just based on a different pool of applicants. So there's a persistence yeah. there. It reminds yeah. me a little yeah. of writing grants. Like sometimes yeah. you get it, sometimes you don't, sometimes you reapply with a slightly tweaked application for the same project and you get it. And it's just, yeah, there's a certain element of uh, who else is also in the pool. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, with un the undergraduate program too. I mean, I think it's mm -hmm. you know we're we're interested in in attracting a diversity of of, of students you know from across southern Ontario. Um, you know, definitely from the the greater Toronto area. You know, who might be, might be interested in that specific focus and working with our amazing faculty. Um, yeah, and and that breadth of background, I think, for both undergraduate or, or graduate students is is certainly a appealing. Um, you know, scientists can write amazingly. Um, you know, that's just one instance. 
Definitely. So I have one final question for you, which speaks a little bit more to the um, the community aspect that we've kind of been circling around and, and touching on throughout this conversation. So, you know, as, aside from amazing movement courses in Hyde Park <laughs> with the trees and delicious meals with your cohort, um, what opportunities does the University of Guelph present to students who are looking to uh, actively participate in in the literary ecosystem like what does guelph's local literary community look like and and how do students get involved with that well we have a monthly reading series called speakeasy um that um yeah is now online but has been in person for a number of years most recently held at the glad day bookstore um in which is a great accessible space we in, love in downtown glad day in downtown Toronto. Yeah. Um, so we're a Toronto, we're a Guelph program, but we're based in Toronto. The graduate program is located on the Humber College North Campus, but a lot of our, our life exists downtown too. So there's Speakeasy, an amazing new um, magazine called, online journal called Held, which was started during the pandemic um, by MFA students in collaboration with the Studio Art MFA students at the University of Guelph, so a collaboration that never happened before, and has really um, reached out um, in those that it publishes to um, underrepresented populations. I think you know everyone who contributed to the first issue um, was either BIPOC or LGBTQ plus um, writers, and many had not been published before. Each issue is themed. They're beautiful. They're gorgeous. I should have the link handy, but I don't at the moment. Um, but you can find held magazine online. We have a collaboration with the uh, Parkdale Public Schools for teaching in the public schools as a, an aspect of community engagement. Mm -hmm. And we bring in a lot of professional visitors and work with the Toronto International Festival of Authors in, in that regard. I think the undergrad program will have its own literary magazine. Um, that's certainly in the works. Um, and there's also a great wealth-based literary community. Um, and I would just you know, give a shout out to Gordon Hill Press, which has a focus on um, writers with disability and is doing great work in that regard. So yeah, um, that's a, just a, a taste of There's what a huge, already there's a huge breadth yeah. of ways that you could get involved, whether it's yeah. more on the, the teaching educational side or the like publishing kind of like, just dependent yeah. on your skills and your interests. It sounds like there's a lot to work with, yeah. yeah. Kinesi, would you like to add anything else about anything that you is particularly close to your heart as far as the literary ecosystem there goes? Oh, I, Catherine uh, just listed everything that I had. Uh, probably I might add uh, there's there's some internal um, programs like Griffin Reads that features one writer with a book uh, every year, I think, mm -hmm. um, for the whole community. So, yeah, the, the, there's so much. There's a lot happening. It's a, a really rich um, vision and, and field of activity. Uh, and uh, certainly I, I benefited greatly from a lot of those. Held wasn't there yet uh, when I was there, but. Yeah, it's a fabulous initiative. And I will just say, you know, I think that there there is a real interest in both the undergraduate and graduate programs in, in community engagement, both literary mm -hmm. and thinking beyond that, you know, because, mm -hmm. Um, you know, writing, literacy, storytelling, language skills are just so important um, to so many. And and to have a chance to work in the Parkdale Public Schools with the seven, eight students and the high school students, I think has been really transformative for a lot of students. So yeah, and I know at the University of Guelph, that community outreach is also, you know, really important. That's great. I had Definitely. a wonderful time in the Parkdale Public yeah. yeah, yeah, I remember, I remember you in it too. And, and I will also add, you know, that Professor Lawrence Hill, um, you know, has brought one of his, his creative writing nonfiction classes to, um, to a female prison in, inmates. And so, you know, one of the classes was working both with Guelph students and, and students um, within the prison system. So that's another initiative that I think is really important and wonderful. Mm -hmm. Definitely lots of ways to get involved outside of a purely classroom, you sitting yes. down with your single project, you know, uh, to really become interconnected and reciprocal, I guess, um, and to really come back to that mindset of being interconnected with everyone. It's fantastic. Well, this has been, I have learned so much in 30 minutes of uh, speaking to the both of you. You're both clearly uh, like people that everyone would want to sit down and, and, and learn from and, and dialogue with. So thank you so much for spending some of your time with us today. 
thank you. Yeah, it's been a thank pleasure. You. And thank you to everyone who is watching at home. To find out more about the creative writing programs at University of Guelph, you can check out www.uofguelph.ca slash arts slash CWMFA. That's for creative writing MFA. If you have any questions regarding the program and admissions, you can send an email to CWMFA at uofguelph.ca. To check out more events and discussions during our Watts 2021 festival, you can go to toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. From all of us at Watts, happy reading and happy studying.